listening to part one of our three-part symposia with Alan Abadessa Green. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free interchange of ideas. I'm Gemini, your host for our symposium with Alan Abadessa Green. Susan, Sabelle, and Chipper will be joining our conversation. Alan is an author, researcher, and editor of Sync Book One, Myths, Magic, Media, and Mindscapes, and Sync Book Two, Outer and Inner Space, Shadow and Light. Both books explore synchronicity and synchromysticism through the writings of authors within the Sync community. This community is defined as a community committed to exploring the impossible. Alan is well-versed in contemporary myths, memes, and synchronicities, revealing amazing insight into ourselves, our culture, and our world. Thinkbook Radio features two weekly podcasts, 42 minutes, and always record with an archive of conversations and interviews with some of the most intriguing minds. Additionally, Alan is the author of a blog titled, Look at All the Happy Creatures, in his soon-to-be-released book, Suicide Kings. Hello, Alan. Thank you for joining us at Sky Blue Symposia. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to speak to you guys. Thank you. Alan, let's start with your new book, Sync Book 2, Outer and Inner Space, Shadow and Light. Hi, Alan. This is Susan. I've been reading your book, or I should say the book you edited with all the wonderful 26 authors, and I wondered if you could speak a little bit about it, and especially about your journey We've kind of followed you from SyncBook One. Now you've got SyncBook Press, SyncBook Radio, and SyncBook Two, and in the future, SyncBook Three. What's it been like for you, and how has it evolved? Oh, yeah, absolutely. This has been a little bit of an adventure. Well, I guess a lot lot of an adventure, and it's all (laughs) sort of, it's snowballing uh, naturally. This is not, we didn't set out with any... uh, just grand, you know, world domination plans or anything like that. Um, I believe, I mean, I've, I've said this many times, and this is the absolute truth, is doing the first sync book was something that I had no real expectations for. It was just something where I had been interacting with a lot of these other writers who either have blogs of their own websites, uh, some of them just do uh, video channels, whether that be on YouTube or Vimeo, and I've been interacting with these other researchers for a while, and I just had this thought of, hey, if we all, I said, what if we all wrote about 10 pages and we'd put together a book? I think that would be fun to do. Very innocent, just sort of like saying, hey, do you guys want to play? Get a bunch of people who I respect together and put them together and see, see what happens with it. And as I, uh, people started responding and, and said, sure, this would be a lot of fun to do, and as the names started coming in and then as the actual chapters started coming in, I was just so impressed. At some point, this went from, hey, what if we did this, to me being the guy who actually gets to see it coming together, start reading these chapters, and as I start assembling the book and just realized, oh, wow, we have something really amazing here. And so that was just wonderful on that level, just to know that we we had that. And then the book was put together, obviously, and people started to read it and uh, we started doing interviews like yours and uh, going out and actually speaking about this and uh, getting all the feedback and the feedback was so positive so strong and people I mean I get emails all the time people with amazing questions amazing insights of their own uh, saying have you ever considered you know this point of view or or I'd really like to see what you guys think of such and such and just this real you know sort of very organic process started where we were able to reach out to a lot of people and have this conversation on such a large scale that it was very inspiring and uh, it snowballed then into SyncBook Press. We had other authors, specifically authors from SyncBook One, who said, well, it was a lot of fun doing this chapter and I think I have more writing here. What if we put together a book? So uh, it's something I have experience doing. I said, sure, let's do it. So the first book we put out was from Andros Jones. It was a book called Accidental Initiations uh, in the Kabbalistic Tree of Olympia. And we put that out, I think that was about five months after, after uh, Sync Book 1. I want to say about five months. I'm, I'm really bad with linear time. You'll have to forgive me. I live in that sort of non-temporal space uh, more often than not. So, um, <laughs> Oh, I understand, yes. <laughs> isn't that the nature of the sink? 
the absolutely i mean it's, it's <laughs> kind of a it's kind of a fuzzy environment well, you know, this this is a little bit of a tangent here, but the the funny thing is that probably one if I'm if I were to be completely honest, one of the challenges in dealing with uh at this point we have fifty two authors, right? We had twenty six authors in the first book, twenty six in the second. It's all brand new authors. So fifty two authors here, a lot of whom spend a lot of time in that fuzzy space of you know, is this you know, was what year is this? Or, you know, is this Thursday? Or <laughs> things like that. So trying to be the guy who uh, sort of herds the cats, uh, let's say, uh, trying to get 52 people onto a sort of time schedule, timeline, deadlines, that was probably one of the bigger challenges uh, that comes with my position in Sync Book Press. Uh, <laughs> so... I've had to learn to be much better about those sorts of things. But nonetheless, I am still enough of that myself that I, I you know, trying to keep track of how many months pass. Uh, I get in trouble with my wife all the time. I say, oh, you know, when we got married, you know, this many months or years ago. And she's like, she just looks at me and shakes her head like, shouldn't, shouldn't you know how long it's actually been? I say, I just know we're together. It's wonderful. It's timeless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good cover. <laughs> but uh, I guess I'm the same way about these books. I mean, these books are my, are my children at this point. Um, I don't, I'm not uh, lucky enough to have children of my own yet. Um, but these are, in a way, these are my children. So I really do feel like uh, when someone comes to me with a, a book project, like Andras did, like Douglas Bowles did, uh, who, who he was, he was our... I guess we would consider our third book, uh, Winter's Labyrinth from Douglas Bowles. When these two gentlemen, who I am friends with on a certain level, uh, but also who I respect as, as artists and thinkers in their own right, and they came to me and working with them, it was wonderful for me to feel like I was nurturing their creative interests. Uh, and I'm really uh, proud and honored that I got to work with these guys. And, and this is true of, of all the Sync Book contributors, uh, even if it's someone just writing a you know, 10 to 15 page chapter, that, that there's a lot in that. And there's a lot of, um, you build a relationship with these people on another level than just admiring their work, um, you know, from afar. Right. So this has been a huge personal development for me. And uh, I think in a, in a strange sort of way, what everyone's seeing in one level is this, let's call this a, a publishing company, a media company, whatever we want, we want to call this, uh, in the sense that, okay, we have books and we do radio shows. And as this sort of develops and grows, I think the most honest answer I can give is what you're seeing is a sort of micro, macro echo of my own personal development of my interests, of re who I'm reaching out to to contribute to these books or who I'm interacting with, who I'm following. And at the same time, where we as a community are now focusing. So this is very, very much my own personal development, my own personal curiosity. And it's such a pleasure to see that other people are just as interested in following along uh, and, and just to have people interact and, and see what we're doing and give us feedback or suggestions, things like that. It's just such a, a really wonderful process. It's an honor. But uh, like I said, I think the most honest answer is this is it's also very much a reflection of my personal development. Isn't that, again, that commonality is a good bit of the basis for synchronicity, I would think, is because we, we experience stuff personally that we carry out into the world and, and it reflects it back to us? Mm, it's an excellent point because I think with synchronicity, sometimes the synchronicities are so personal that it's really hard to to share them. We've all, I, I think, uh, particularly within the sync community, we've all had this experience where there's something so mind-blowingly connected where it's like, oh, this was this major epiphany moment of how these things were connected. And I'm trying to tell somebody about, it. I was at the supermarket and this guy mentioned, you know, earl earlier today I had a conversation where my, my wife and I were looking to rent a car and the thing came up as a Ford Focus. And I was like, no, I just got an email from some guy about a car accident with a Ford Focus. And you know, just different things. And she's just looking like, well, what does this have to do with anything? It's hard sometimes to convey a personal synchronicity or why something is significant. Uh, and yet, 
we feel compelled to do it, and I think compelled to study this, because even though my personal synchronicity might not be exactly your personal synchronicity, the fact that we all experience it and we're all interested in it is what brings us together. So I think the challenge with doing sync book type stuff is to find that middle ground where what are the synchronicities that we can share and and discuss and sometimes the things that are so personal you don't really put out I mean when I first started blogging about synchronicity you, you kind of shoved everything in there or you tried to and then at some point you realize okay I just have to trim stuff out because these are things that only mean something to me right Alan um, don't for- forget about the radio you've got two programs a week sync book radio and i know i've listened to a number of them and been introduced to a lot of new people how did that arise out of this organic process well the first show was 42 minutes and that's from douglas bowles and will morgan they were both in the first sync book they're both contributors to the first sync book Again, these were two gentlemen who had been interacting, uh, commenting on each other's blogs, things like that. And they are sort of long-term observers and participants in this community. And I know that uh, they kind of had this conversation amongst themselves. What if we started something, doing a conversation where each week we talk to someone from the sync community? And then I don't know how long that conversation was going on sort of without my involvement. But at some point they reached out to me because of the sync book and... We just sort of brought those ideas together. So at first it was sort of just me providing a a home for for their their show. And then then it very quickly, I think, turned to something where my role is, I don't know, maybe we want to call it a producer or or, or something. They'll contact me and say, hey, we're, we're thinking of having this guy on. But, I mean, they're brilliant guys. They do a wonderful show. I try never to step on any toes. So basically mm-hmm. they're very, ind- you know, they're very independent. I don't want to be, I think that's, that, you know, even with my approach to editing these sync books, I don't want to be the boss of, you know, the master of sync book press. What I want is these people who I enjoy what they do, let's see if we can bring them together and let some interesting stuff happen. So when they, they might ask me what I think about such and such or, scheduling certain guests or or if you know some sort of assistance here or there uh and i am doing things where i'm updating the website and doing the uh different internet web coding and i do graphic design for the site so i'm doing a lot of the upkeep and maintenance but as far as their show i just let them have you know what they have fun and and i enjoy listening to it i think that's actually how probably how it started was i just enjoy listening to it so much and (laughs) We would talk about it, and then ultimately I just kind of became involved. And then the second show we do, Always Record, is another gentleman. His name is Bill Klaus. He had contacted me about another project he was doing. Uh, he, he has something he calls the Kubrick Transformer, where he put together Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, Stanley Kubrick's mm-hmm. 2001 A Space Odyssey, and Pink Floyd's The Wall that he has all three pieces of media playing at the same time, and he's arranged it in such a way that he thinks these sort of overlapping, what's, uh, what we're kind of calling synchronicities, this is, this is where we get into, I'm going to try and kind of boil this down, is when we say trying to find commonality, we said before maybe some synchronicities are too personal, so we try and find mm-hmm. that common ground of, what synchronicity can I show you that has the same significance to you that it might have to me? So right. that's why a lot of synchromistics venture into media analysis because it's almost mm. like a shared dream. If we watch the same movie, it's almost like you and I had the same dream. If we treat that movie as the same way we would dissect uh, a dream imagery, well, we can kind of say you and I shared the same vision. Right. So this, of course, there are how shall we say, uh, issues that arise from that. Uh, you have <laughs> people who are you know, claiming there's you know, mass media control, which, of, of course, to a certain extent there is. I might, ha- I might disagree on what exactly that means or to what extent that goes. But uh, mm-hmm. without a doubt, these are planned uh, and, and orchestrated events. But as, mm-hmm. an, as an artist myself, I know that 
just planning and organizing something doesn't take away from the fact that there are unintended, shall we say, unintended symbolism or or synchronicities of the way things time out. I'd really like, as we maybe go a little later into the show, to discuss something that seems to be really large right now is everyone's so fascinated by this Sandy Hook, let's call it for the moment, synchronicity of Sandy Hook in this Batman movie. Right now, this is something where the conversation is, is this intentional? Did someone plant this as either predictive programming or evidence of some conspiracy or whatever it might be? Or is this a synchronicity? Well, this is where whenever we venture into using media as our shared dream, there are, of course, other variables and aspects of the conversation we have to address. But there are moments where it seems like if we at least treat media... So let's have the conversation one piece at a time is to say we can treat media as a shared dream, a shared psychedelic experience, whatever we want to call it. We can at least all see the same movie and talk about it. So that's a very common thing amongst synchromystics. And just to say about always record is that Bill Klaus approached me with this particular arrangement that he thought lined up in such a way that these were, whether they're, it's whether it's intentional, whether it's synchronicities, whatever it was, it lined up in such a way that he saw something of immense value there and he contacted me we spoke about what this could mean and we just kind of had a conversation and that conversation then started to include this gentleman whose name is david plate he also goes by the name mk ultrasound Mm -hmm. a fascinating blogger and visual artist really just an amazing guy and I was having conversations with Bill, and then I was having conversations with David. That would just we'd start talking on Skype, and the conversations would last two or three hours. And it turns out they started having conversations with each other, and they would last two or three hours. And every one of us, every time these conversations would end with, "Oh man, we should have recorded that. That was such <laughs> uh, such an interesting conversation." And that's since we kept saying, "Oh man, we should have recorded that." We started a show where the three of us just talk. That's called always record. We just start talking and whatever, you know, sometimes it's just conversational. Sometimes we really dive deep into a subject, but it's basically long form dialogue with no specific agenda, just capturing that moment and seeing where it goes. And it's been, for me, it's been the most therapeutic day of my week that I look (laughs) forward to because when I do interviews you know, I sort of have to be the voice of Syncbook Press, and uh, there's a sort of um, not just responsibility, but uh, I, I'm always very careful because now I'm speaking for 56, you know, excuse me, 52 people. Uh, mm-hmm. To a certain extent, I'm speaking for other people. I don't want to. I'm always so cautious. I don't want to put words in someone's mouth or misrepresent their viewpoints. But when it comes to this show on th- every Thursday, I just look at it as talking with some. Uh, people who I really respect, who I consider my friends at this point, and just getting to kind of play. It's like, let's go into a sandbox and just play, see what happens, develop ideas, bounce them off each other, and it's really, really therapeutic. I, I, I enjoy it, and the feedback we are getting says that other people are really enjoying it, too, and that's that's wonderful. Absolutely. I'm so glad. Um, yeah, and it sounds like you're a, a sink weaver to me. You're weaving all these different sync threads together. Sounds brilliant. <laughs> yeah, now, that's, the t- just to say, that's, that's a skill that I learned from uh-huh. some of the people that I'm including in the sync book. I'm, I'm in no way the originator of um, this form of, of sync weaving. It's something that I found, I came across a number of years ago, and I thought was so fascinating. Guys like uh, Jay Kotze, Goro Adachi, Steve Wilner... Christopher Knowles, these guys were doing this probably going back to like 2007 maybe and I came across their work and it was a way of seeing how they did something. Even if I at this point disagree with again, we're all going to see the same thing. We might have a different uh, idea of what it means at the end of Mm -hmm. the day but this Mm -hmm. skill of learning how to see how these uh, patterns and synchronicities weave together is something that I give much credit to some of these other guys uh, who came before. Wow. Now, the title of the new Sync Book is Sync Book 2, Outer and Inner Space, Shadow and Light. And those are very polarizing subjects. 
how did you come up with that title and what does it say about the writing in of the 26 contributing authors okay yeah i think polarizing i i, I definitely see that uh there is a sort of yin yang aspect to the the first two books you'll notice the first book is the cover is black with white text this book is white with black text yeah right? so so even those putting those two books next to each other you have a very polarized uh, sort of thing. What's what's mm-hmm. funny is that the first book, even though it has the black cover, has mm-hmm. more um, light-hearted, feel-good, sort of new agey. Oh, mm-hmm. synchronicity means we're all one, we're all together, and everything's beautiful. And the second book is, uh, even though it has the white cover and it looks much brighter, has a lot more people who see it as something uh, dark, maybe a sort more of a sort of gnostic. Yes, everything's connected, but this could almost be a Matrix-like prison, you know? I mean, the reason I... I think one of the things that I felt like I had to do with the second sync book was to put in more of those voices. And it's not that I, necessarily that I see it that way. I, I think I, if I had to say, I would probably fall somewhere close to the middle of those two positions, uh, but probably leaning a little more towards things are beautiful, but definitely with a very healthy dose of there's a lot of darkness in this world. Yeah. And there's certainly manipulation. There's certainly control and, and, and you know, just plenty of things we should be very, very aware of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm certainly open to that, um, let's say, uh, darker Gnostic perspective. But I think after doing the first book, it just felt like, even though there are voices like that in the first book, it felt like um, the only way to approach this from the utmost honesty, was to include these these other perspectives. Again, it, I'm really very cautious to put my opinion on it, especially after I've and, you know invited someone into the book. I think this is the something I've learned is I've had to do a very delicate dance. Is you know you don't ask someone to contribute to your book and then say why you disagree with them. And at the same time, <laughs> we, we you know I just feel like that would be kind of rude. And at the same time. The whole point of putting these things together is so we can start a conversation. There's no way that you're going to read these books and agree with all 52 authors because, yes, there are some very different perspectives. There are, the, you know, there are polarized positions. What I'm trying to do is if we put them all together, perhaps we can find some shades of gray. Perhaps we can just sort of see what stands up, what doesn't. You know, I'm, I'm okay with, and I hope everyone's adult enough that you know, if their perspective is put alongside everyone else's and it doesn't hold up, well, then that's, you know, that's where the chips fall. I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, obviously do uh, any, any, any manipulation of that. But to say I think it's important that these ideas are laid out alongside each other so we can and not just, again, like I said, this is my development as much as anyone else's. So mm-hmm. uh, I need to stress that because for me, these are things I wrestle with. I, the world it does seem to be beautifully interconnected as if it's this Eden-like structure of, oh, everything's connected, we're all one, everything's beautiful. And at the same time, how do you account for all this darkness? So if I wrestle with those ideas, I assume everyone else is wrestling with those ideas. The only way to really get down to business is let's put them next to each other and start talking about it. Yeah, and that's and what it, I thought had to happen. It so sounds the like shadow... It, it sounds like they're very complimentary then, Alan. <laughs> yeah. You know, part of the whole picture. Yeah, I mean, I realize that's basically what we're doing is you have to sort of put everything on the table and see and see what happens. And I, I actually come from a perspective that each one of these positions, it's not like someone's going to contribute a chapter and, oh, they're quote-unquote disqualified or anything like that. Everyone contributes something to the conversation. I can read I, a researcher and say, okay, I disagree with 90% of that. But there is something that that perspective brings to the conversation that just by being a unique perspective changes the game enough, makes us reconsider something that is mm-hmm. so vital. So my thing is, I can and ask someone into the book, even if I only agree with 10% of what they say, because it, I feel like it needs to happen. That needs to be brought in. It, it adds something to the conversation. Everything does. Everything does. Uh, the only thing that I, I guess if I really had to say that I would be um, 
hesitant to include would be something where I, I always have an issue if someone says, I know it means yeah. this, you know, there's really hardcore positions of I'm, well, I'm going to lay it out for you. You know, we don't need a, some two bit guru telling us their, their dogma. That's, that's where I would probably get into, um, you know, some, some issues. I like the idea of shadow and light because there's more darkness in this. I felt like I had to acknowledge it. The gentleman who designed the book cover for this, who's actually designed most of our book covers, his name is Justin Morgan, does a beautiful job. And he had he took issue with us saying shadow and light as part of the book title. It was just a conversation we were having. He's like, I really don't like that. And I said, well, I feel like we have to address the fact that there's more darkness in this. And this really why I set out to do, I think, a certain amount of this book is dedicated to it. It's not to say it's, an, it's a dark book. Obviously, it's both. It's shadow and light. But I had mm-hmm. to sort of, you know, I believe in truth and advertising. I don't <laughs> want, you know, I don't want to say here's a, here's, you know, I want to call it love and light. And then it's like, wow, this is actually pretty dark. The other thing being outer and inner space is because a number of people, and this might actually tell us something. I actually think it's very telling. Uh, and we can go in this conversation if we want to, that not only are there more people in this book looking at the shadow worlds, the sort of darker aspects, but there's also a lot more people who are touching on themes of outer space. And not, not necessarily like just aliens, but if you're looking at the outer control structure, that outer structure looks darker. The people mm-hmm. who are very inward focused, they're finding, hey, I'm full of light. Now, this mm-hmm. could, of course, be prejudice. We don't look inside ourselves, and we usually don't shout about how dark our psyches are. We, you know, uh, this, this is a failing on one part, is that we always say, I look inside and I see how beautiful everything is. Well, nonsense. <laughs> You're full of darkness. We all are. Um, we could all be wonderfully nice people, but we all have darkness within us. We've all done terrible things that we, you know, might, whether we regret them or, or we would take them back or... Or anything like that. No, no one is is free of of darkness. Nor should we maybe want to be. I also have issues with this pure light approach. Seems to deny the obvious. Not that we mm-hmm. should live in a you know some strict dichotomy. Uh, we don't want to just live in a black and white universe. But to deny that there's any darkness in this world seems naive. And again, it's, it seems like there's not the truth in advertising, the gurus who say, look inside and you're going to find all this light and all this beauty, I feel like they're basically selling a faulty product because we all know that when you wrestle with something, you wrestle with it. We've all had to, this is something I keep on always record, I've been spent the last few shows really kind of talking about, this idea that too many people, in, in my opinion, I mean, it's a harsh phrase, but there's too many people out there who are just talking about the light and how beautiful it can all be. And I'm the one getting the emails of people saying, this is really hard. You know, people with suicidal <laughs> thoughts, people with, you know, this is making me feel crazy or, or something like that. You know, how do we, you know, you're we're doing all this research and you're studying the conspiracies while at the main, same time, you know, studying the new age philosophy and all this stuff and you're having a hard time reconciling them and someone feels torn apart inside or upset or depressed. Mm -hmm. Well, these Mm -hmm. are natural things we all have to deal with. So for someone Mm -hmm. to get out there and go, oh, it's all going to be beautiful. Like, don't lie to people. Do not Mm -hmm. get out there and say it's all going to be beautiful. No, it's going to be hard because life is sometimes really, really hard. Doesn't mean it stops being beautiful. It just means what's what's Call it what it is. Let's be honest. Yeah. Well, dark night of the soul is part of the journey. Absolutely, yeah. We are speaking with Alan Abadessa Green. Alan, tell us about other events in which you were involved and where one can purchase your books. Oh, thank you. My website is syncbookpress.com, or you can go to thesyncbook.com. I should point out that sync, we're spelling S-Y-N-C. A lot of people are either adding or adding an H at the end. It's just S Y N C. So we can do syncbookpress.com or thesyncbook.com. My own website is allthehappycreatures.com. Um, we have done live events. We actually did a live event last January. 
We had people giving slide shows, different presentations of their information for synchromysticism. And then some people who make, like a gentleman named Kevin Halcott, who makes videos based on exploring different synchromistic threads. Uh, he showed a video. My, my wife danced. We had a dance segment. We had a gentleman, Andros Jones, who, who wrote the book uh, Accidental Initiations and who contributed to the first sync book. He does a show called Radio 8 Ball. It's actually a really interesting uh, concept. He was doing it as a radio show, which was they would have people call in and they ask a question. So it's sort of like, you know, you used to shake the magic eight ball. So someone calls in and asks a question. And then he has, you know, 30 different songs there and he puts it on shuffle. And whatever song comes up, that's the answer to the question. And then the, he would have the person who called in, you know, and they would have a conversation analyzing it. So you can consider that like a, he calls it sometimes like a musical tarot card or the obvious reference to a magic eight ball. But he played with this radio format for a number of years and then he started doing live shows and we incorporated Andras's format into our live synchromysticism event where Andras came and the audience members were able to ask a question and then since Andras is a musician he would perform one of these eight songs that would be, we would choose at random you know, kind of like cards with numbers one to eight on it and the person picks the number out of a hat and okay that's the song he's going to perform and that's the answer to the question now, Andros was doing this, you know, he's an interesting guy. He does this more as a sort of entertainment format. And then there's this obvious correlation that he realizes is this is synchronicity in action. You know, there's the entertainment aspect of it. But you can look at that as why does that work? You know, ultimately, why, does, why would a format like that even work? And the, sometimes these songs come up that are so specific, such an answer to a question it's it's just shocking. It's like when those synchronicities hit, when it's a real synchronicity, it hits you to the bone. There's no doubting that it's something really, really, really uh, profound. So you're able to capture these either on a radio format or in a live event. Uh, it was really kind of wonderful. And he just adds an, a nice twist there of, as an entertainer, able to bring some of this out. You know, we talked about what are the applications of synchronicity. Well, there's this idea of spiritual development. There's the idea of perhaps being able to better discern our conspiracy research. But something that probably nearer and dearer to my heart is you can use it to create art with. And a gentleman like Andras and Bill and David Plate, uh, these guys who are you taking synchronicity and making artwork with it, it just really speaks to my heart. And it's just this other area that I just, I just want to see more and more of it. I, I love it. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Let's rejoin Alan and Susan in their conversation. Speaking of dark, normally when we think of dark, we think of the feminine. And I heard you describe the sync book, too, as sort of a lunar book, including tides and waves and flooding, both inner and outer. I wondered if you could speak of that, because I thought, found that fascinating. Oh, absolutely. I think it also, it was the moment in which this book was developed, I think was also, many of us seem to be having this sort of dark night of the soul. You know, this is, uh, I don't know if this is great advertising for a product, but it seemed while 2012 was sort of winding down, this book was coming together, everyone was experiencing their own little rough patches. Mm-hmm. And, and in some cases, not that little. It seemed like we were all kind of experiencing a dark night of the soul at the same time. Now, I think this is probably true on a bigger scale outside of just our little circle of people who worked on this book. It seemed to be what we were observing in the world. And part of that, of course, comes down to this idea of the 2012 apocalyptic doomsday fear porn and things like that. But we we were yeah. a group, you know, as a group, there's very few people in in, that I can think of that took that at all seriously, so uh, that I, that I'm uh, dealing with, and so I don't think that was it, but perhaps that that's part of the uh, the wider scale. But it seemed like everyone was going through a rough patch. Everyone was kind of having to deal with more material issues or hard things in their life, and I think that 
by opening up this book, you know, I, I believe everything works fractally. I think everything is interconnected, which synchronicity shows us. So mm -hmm. it's sort of like when I said, hmm, we're going to do sync book two, we have to let in a little more darkness. Well, I opened the door and we got it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, so uh, it, was, it was literally like, okay, let's, let's face this. And, you know, since we, we can go back to that Stanley Kubrick idea of room 237, you guys are familiar with uh, Jay Widener. Has yes. This idea. 237 <laughs> is the moon room, right? You know, that could be, that could be true on, um, if his theory is, is, is accurate, that could mean that on one level, that Stanley Kubrick was encoding his moon cover-up. That could be the mm -hmm. case. The other idea is that this place you have to go is you sort of have to go into room 237. You have to go mm -hmm. in and face your fears and face your darkness. So, you know, this idea of... This idea just kind of kept being part of the conversation of having to face your shadow, having to face your inner devil, having to go into room 237. All these little metaphors mm -hmm. kept coming up again and again and again and again in our conversations and in our sort of group dialogues and things like that. And it seemed to go so hand in hand with the moment of me saying, I want to do a book that includes some more of these, I mean, for lack of a better term, darker perspectives. It just went, it just fits so perfectly. Then we have specific moon references. Like there's a, a gentleman, Mark LeClaire. I mean, one of the finest writers that you will find at this point. I mean, aside mm -hmm. from being brilliant from a sync perspective, because I, I mean, Mark and I have a lot of disagreements, again, on like what it means. But I love talking to the guy and I love reading his stuff because, you know, you could have a brilliant researcher who's a terrible writer. This guy is fortunately, is both. He's a brilliant researcher and a fantastic writer. I just love reading his writing. And mm. he, he wrote this chapter, which I think is, um, you know, somewhat tongue-in-cheek. It's called Moon again, in the Middle. Moon in Moon the Middle. In middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he asked if that could be the 13th chapter in the book. Um, since it was Moon in the Middle, he wanted to play that up and said, you know, is it possible that that could be the 13th chapter? I said, if it works out, I said, I'll, I'll definitely consider that. And if there's no reason to deny it, then absolutely I'll go through with that. So it, 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 it ended up, there was no issue. His chapter, it seems to me, again, I don't want to speak for him, but it seems to me he's arguing an exaggerated Gnostic principle almost for the sake of arguing it. It's a sort of, I'm hesitant to say this because I don't. Again, I don't want to speak for him, but it seems like his argument is sort of let's argue something we all know isn't true, but argue it so eloquently that you start to question. You have to put major question marks on everything after reading it. If I can argue so eloquently for something that you know is not true, then what does that say about everything else you do believe to be true, or everything else that's just been argued so well that you accept it as truth? Yeah, that, to me, is how I read that chapter. I don't know if that's how Mark intended it or, or what it is. <laughs> He's a bit of a trickster, so that's, you know, that's open to interpretation. That's how mm. I interpret that chapter. Now, you, you, know, you mentioned this, this feminine idea. So, of course, we have that very often the feminine is thought of as the darker, even though most people wouldn't think of it that way on the surface at any point of even mildly scratching the surface. Of course, the, the feminine is the unconscious. It's the deep waters. It's, it's, the, it's the darkness out of which all things emerge. It is mm -hmm. all of those things at once. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll notice on the cover to this book, there is a Vesica Pisces. Now, that's because the first book actually featured an eclipse. Justin, on the, the, if you look at the Sync Book 1 cover... You will mm -hmm. see behind the sync book, he put a, an eclipse. And what he wanted it to represent was not only this number two, so some duality, but perhaps the parting of those two you know, eclipses, two uh, heavenly bodies overlapping. So maybe this is with right. some slight uh, separation of the two. These are s coming mm -hmm. out of that eclipse, let's say. Now, that's interesting on all sorts of levels. Perhaps that eclipse book had more of a unified argument, whereas this has a little bit more of a schism. But of course, we have what we're left with in that is a Vesica Pisces, which is a right. uniquely feminine uh, symbol. Right. 
Yes, absolutely. And it's fascinating, too, that wasn't this, wasn't it released at the uh, lunar eclipse? It was released November 20. See, it was supposed to be released November 29th, and we actually released it a few days early. I believe it was the 26th. 26th, yeah. yeah. Now, so yes, there was an eclipse that day. And what's even funnier is there was some question as to whether or not this book was going to be done on time for a whole number of reasons. Part of which is, again, dealing with 26 people who don't necessarily (laughs) exist in a world of deadlines. And then um, the other thing is Justin, the graphic designer for this book, is a very sort of in demand talent. He's he's just we're so damn lucky to have this guy. Um, but of course, being that talented means that you have a lot of clients that are paying you a lot more than a uh, sync book <laughs> press can afford. So there was some there was some question as to whether or not this book cover was going to be done in time. And yeah. I started to have a little freak out, like, okay, well. What's going to happen here? And Justin kept saying, well, I can get to it in a few weeks and get to it in a few weeks. And so I'm getting, we're all kind of getting a little nervous as to whether or not this is actually going to happen. And he finally, just a few weeks before the thing's going to come out, he sits down to start working on it. And when he sat down to start working on it, he realized that was the day of an eclipse. So I think November actually had two eclipses or maybe late October had an eclipse. Uh, I don't recall the... uh, the exact dates, but he sat down to work on it very close to the date of the release, and when he he realized that day, and even he was getting nervous, oh, am I going to be able to do this in time? And then when he realized that he was doing it in the middle of an eclipse, he said, okay, that's a synchronicity that says this was the right time. It seemed like I was cutting it close, but everything works out perfectly. Here I'm doing an eclipse artwork, and I sat down without even realizing to do it on the day of an eclipse. And then, I'm not thinking about astrology at this point. I'm thinking, oh man, can we get this done? That's the world, (laughs) that's the world I was living in. So he, he does the cover and then I have to get, I had to get a rushed book proof and do all these sorts of things. And I put so much extra time into doing a whole getting this done. Since I thought there was a real chance we weren't going to be going to meet our release date, I put in hours and hours and hours of extra work. Such to the point that I actually had the book ready early. So I had the option of releasing it on November, I think I said, I think 26th or 27th, you know, two, three days early. So I said, okay, well, I put in all this work. Why the hell not? Let's release the book a few days early. That day turned out to be an eclipse. So (laughs) it all works out. There you go. And I'm going to mention this too, because even though we've been talking about all this shadow and darkness throughout the book is Mark Golding's, absolutely amazing mandalas, healing magic mandalas. And I tell you, it's almost worth getting the book just to look at them. They're absolutely Uh, magnificent. I'm so Um, glad you you mentioned him because he really, it just adds something so magnificent. Uh, Yeah, yeah. I don't don't know how to put it into words. Well, his article brought me to tears. His essay brought me to tears. It was so beautiful. And reading it, every time I go, I I haven't been reading it from cover to cover. I've kind of just opened it up. And every time I do, I have a sync experience of what's going on in my life with the essay or the article that I'm reading in the sync book. So (laughs) it's, it's, (laughs) it's reverberating out. Absolutely. Well, yeah, in that, I just want to stop you because in that aspect, it's definitely a, a magical artifact. You know, we can argue what that means, but mm-hmm. uh, ultimately, it, it it is. It's something where I hear this all the time. People saying to me, "Whatever I pick up this book, I'm having a synchronicity with what I'm reading at that moment." So, for Absolutely. a book about synchronicity to be connected to people's synchronicities, it seems to not just contain the very subject that that it, it's about, but it seems to be part of the process. And I think that's something that Mark Golding would be very pleased with because although not everyone takes a magical perspective, I mean, we have, you know, mainstream psychologists in here who would probably say, you know, fooey, there's no magic. Uh, Again, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I know Mark Golding, that was his intention. He felt like Mm -hmm. this is an opportunity to imbue an object with some healing magic, what the world needs. 
And if, if, that, if, if his chapter brought you to tears, which it did for me as well, ultimately, I know a lot of people don't read these things cover to cover. I actually put in care to structure the chapters in such a way that if someone read from beginning to end, that they would get a sort of, there would be a certain sense of order there. Mm -hmm. I know that no one reads it that way, and I'm not trying to argue that people should. I'm just saying I do put some thought, or uh, do put a significant amount of thought into how these chapters are ordered. And what my idea was is that since Mark's chapter deals with the very things we've been talking about, going into the heart of darkness, facing your shadow, facing your struggle, and coming yeah. out the other side stronger for it, I felt like I'm going to do a book that includes a lot of these darker perspectives. Not yeah. just because I'm some sadistic guy who wants you to think about, you know, Archon or, or whatever it might be, <laughs> but because I'm, it's, it's a way of saying, hey, yes, all of you, I want you to face some of your shadows, myself mm -hmm. included. We all need to face some of our darkness. However, it's not that I want to trap you there. I don't want to keep you in this, you know, uh, Alex Jones fear perspective. I'm saying, <laughs> let's look at it. Let's look at it. You know, let's look at some darkness, and then using Mark Golding as the example, uh, I think mm -hmm. is a very as a very beautiful example of a man who faced it, overcame it, and came through the other side stronger for it. That's the point. The idea of facing your darkness, or when we talk about like you know a Jungian idea of integrating your shadow, all these different things we can you know kind of go into, but it doesn't mean you. So, you know, oh, we're, we're Satan worshippers or we're going to, you know, no, you know, no, no. we're all going to wear, you know, black nail polish and, you know, sit in the dark chanting or something. It means face your darkness, realize that it's a part of you, integrate what you can, overcome what you can, but ultimately not to get stuck there. You don't go into room 237 and live there. No. It's a scary place. It's an ugly place, but you have to go there. You have to face it, face yeah. your fears, and then you can come through the other side stronger. And I, I just think Mark is such a wonderful person, such a wonderful artist, and his, not just his mandalas, which are beautiful, but his chapter means so much to me. And I'm yes. glad that, I'm glad you got out of it what I did. Yes, it was just absolutely stunning and very fitting for the last chapter in the book, brought everything together in a magic healing mandala of light and dark and inner and outer. So brilliant, brilliant. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, re I'm really glad that, that you felt it because that, that's, I think, the intention that was put into it. Uh, I think I can speak for Mark in that case. That was his intention, and I know it was mine, and I'm glad that someone yeah. experienced it. Well, yes, <laughs> most definitely. Went through a box of tissue, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> lovely, lovely. Thanks. This concludes part one of our three-part symposia with Alan Abadessa Green.